going into policy design. Okay, this is the second component. High cash value life insurance. I'm a, let's say I'm a customer, I'm a, I'm a pr prospect, I'm looking at this, I'm trying to get educated. What are my options on designing a policy? Well, we, well, I've already broken it down for you where we've got whole life and index universal. I gotta decide between the two. Based on the player that you decide to work with, they're going to steer you in one direction and they will bash the other one. Or they'll just provide evidence, facts, resources, blogs, articles to support why they like Index Universal Life over Whole Life or why they like Whole Life over Index Universal Life. So you as the client want to be aware of that. Hey, at the end of the day, this person is a salesman. They're trying to teach me what they're doing, right? If I like what they teach, if I like what they do, and I'm in sync with them, then I move forward. But if I want to, you know, get like more information, then here's how you can dive a little bit further to identify that that agent that you end up that you want to end up working with, right? So policy design is a major component. Your number one goal is do not create a Mac. No matter what policy design you go with, you want to ensure that your policy does not become a mech at any point in time as you're funding a life insurance policy. What you have to understand as an individual is your chance of creating a mech increases the moment you decide to overfund a life insurance policy, right? So no matter what you do, no matter what policy design you go with, no matter what insurance company you go with, the moment you overfund a life insurance policy, you are increasing the chance of becoming a mech. So what we do as insurance agents and what you can do as the client is understand mech laws right? These MEC laws are established by the IRS, okay? The MEC stands for Modified Endowment Contract. It's also a seven-pay test. So, a easy example, right? Easy example. What am I doing? Come back here. Yeah. Easy example is if, um, if I'm putting 7K a year into a policy, I have to have a mech that is higher than 7K, period, right? Based on the split, right? Based on the split of the policy will determine how much money I can overfund a policy with. So, give you an example. This is a in-force life insurance illustration based on the 2020 dividend scale with Guardian Life Insurance Company of America based on a 23-year-old individual by the name of Denzel Rodriguez, right? Perfect health, male, started in 2019 is when this policy was established, putting in $70,000 a year into the policy is what I'm funding. My base premium is $7,000, okay? So, in regards to the MEC limit, right? When I'm funding a policy, whatever you're funding, money goes into two places regarding whole life. So let me be clear, this is a whole life policy right? And with whole life, money goes into two places. Premium, right? Base annual premium, and then net cash value, or what's called paid up additions, right? So, when you're putting money into a policy, your MEC limit is literally based off of the death benefit, 
you have to understand that the IRS is making sure that Denzel Rodriguez is not taking advantage of the tax-free advantages that life insurance has to offer. We want to make sure we're not taking advantage of it. The reason for that is because a lot of wealthy people, right, or just people in general, predominantly wealthy individuals, back then, many years ago, they were using life insurance as a means to stop paying taxes, to avoid crazy amount of taxes. So what they were doing was they were dumping millions, billions of dollars into life insurance and they were not getting taxed anything because you can't tax something that's not an investment, right? So life insurance, again, is not an investment, so therefore it cannot be taxed. This word dividend in insurance terms means return of premium. So that means the individual overfunded a policy and then that company gave me a return of premium in the form of cash, what they call a dividend. And I can use that cash today, tax-free, to pay bills, finance things like vacations, equipment, tools, projects, mortgages, car loans, student loans, finance anything through here. Pay off debt, fund a business, I could write loans to my own business, not pay taxes on the loan, right? Because it's a loan. Just pay taxes on the interest gains. Pretty powerful. So understanding the more, the more time you spend on this, this will help you determine whether your policy was designed correctly or incorrectly. Um, even if your policy was not designed correctly, there are ways to get out of it. <clears throat> there are ways to you know, prevent the policy from becoming a mech. So if someone has, in the chat room here, we got 97 people in the house. If you want to prevent creating a mech, right, and you're, you get a letter in the mail saying that, hey, if you keep funding your policy like this, you're gonna create a mech. Well, the way to avoid that is doing what's called a reduce paid up, or you decrease how much you're overfunding that policy. Okay, so really spending a lot of time on the mech is going to help you come up with a policy design. Now, there's only so many ways to design a policy. And here are the ways right here in terms of the split. Right, so money goes to two places, cash value, premiums. Premiums, cost of insurance, cash value, PUAs, paid up additions. Right, and then the other place that your money goes is fees. Right, you've got term rider costs, sales load, charges, annual charges. Right, there's little charges here and there in all different types of permanent life insurance policies. So that's the technically the third place that money goes. Now, um, when you put money into a PUA, which is in fact a rider, so the fee is in the cash value or is in the premium. So that's why I say it's, it's two, but you know, if you want to be technical, it's three. Um, riders do have fees attached to them. And again, these are all important to know as a, as a customer. So, you know, you don't get blindsided like, oh, I didn't know I had to pay this fee, this fee, that fee, this fee, whose fee, right? <clears throat> you're, you're aware. The more aware you are as a client, the better the agent can serve you. The better you can decide whether that agent is for me or not for me. So in regards to splits, you can go as high as 90-10 according to IRS limitations and the insurance company, the insurance company limitation. So the life insurance company that you decide to go with has a limitation on their max. The IRS also has their own limitation as well. And it's usually in sync with whatever MEC limit you have on that, on that policy. So I can go as high as 90-10. This is an example of a 90-10 split. 
70,000 principal going in, 7,000 base premium, 1090. If I were to do a 80-20, right, I'm putting, say, 70,000 a year times 20%, my base premium would be 14,000, right? If I went with 40% of 70,000, my base premium would be $28,000, okay? Now, the moment we start getting into companies, policy design and splits, you are going to either come to a conclusion of facts mixed with opinions and then you come to a conclusion based on where you want to end up going, right? So you as the client, you want to be most comfortable understanding why your agent is saying to go with a 90-10, with a 80-20, a 70-30, a 60-40. Now, this is my personal opinion which is backed up by facts and evidence, which I would say anything past 60-40, in my opinion, based on facts and evidence, puts you in the danger zone. What is the danger zone? Simply means that you are now stepping into traditional whole life insurance, where you're not actually benefiting from this word, high cash value life insurance it's going to take you a significantly longer period of time to just break even on your money, right? Imagine if I, like you saw this policy right here, 70 grand, 7K base premium. According to the MEC laws, the insurance company's limitations, this is allowed. Current status, look at that, it says not a mech, right? Not a mech. So when you see this, and then maybe you're talking to an agent that says, oh, uh, we do 50-50 split. So $70,000 times 50% is $35,000. Why on earth would you, the client, agree to give $70,000 of principal, right? And pay 35K in cost, right? I don't know why you would do that. Now, the only reason why an individual would do that is because they never saw a 60-40 split, a 70-30, a 80-20, a 90-10. They've never seen it, nor does, nor has the agent ever seen it done. It's just how they were taught. Now, what I'll reveal to you, and I'll show you an example, is the insurance agent, we make money right here. We get paid off the premium, which is the cost, the cost of insurance. Majority of our commission comes from the premium. So let's say I'm receiving a 55% commission based off of the premium. 35,000 times 55%, right? If I designed you a policy where you're like, Denzel, I, got, I have 70 grand too. I wanna throw it into a policy and earn money like you do. And let's say I don't show you my policy, but I, I design a 50-50 split design. And I say, yeah, here's how it works. and. You know, your cash value is going to grow over a period of time. It's guaranteed to grow. You're going to get a death benefit and all this stuff. Everything is factually true, what I'm telling you. You're going to earn money, right? It's tax-free. You can use the money however you want and all this stuff. It's just not going to be as efficient, right? So me as the agent, oh, if I do a 50-50 split, 35000 times 55%, my commission is $19,250, and that is just based off of the base premium. You have to understand, insurance agents also get paid off the PUA. 
So the other 35K that went into PUA, and you guys probably hear that car alarm, so forgive me. Um, so the other 35K that went into PUA, we get, um, I want to say, roughly a 2% commission off of the other 35K that went into cash. So that's, you know, roughly about $700. So Denzel would get paid roughly $20,000 or more in commission, one policy, right? Same exact policy, right? Let, let's say you, you went with this company, Guardian, and you were my age. Let's say we're the same age, same health rating, same funding amount, same company, same, everything is the same. The only difference is the cost right that's it the cost denzel pays seven thousand whereas joe pays thirty five thousand dollars why on earth would he do that well that's it simply boils down to you doing your research your homework and coming to a conclusion based on facts and opinions so if your agent believes that 50 50 is the best way to go well, he probably believes that because he's getting a nice, fat commission, right? A commission for me on this policy is many, many, many thousands of dollars less, right, than 20000 You know, I probably get paid below $7,000 in, in commission, right? Because, again, we get paid off the premiums and the PUAs. So as an agent, the more premium I charge you, the more commission I will make. And that is a strong case to argue against in terms of w why someone would do a 50-50 versus a 60-40 or 70-30 or 80-20 or 90-10. So in my, in my own personal opinion, the higher I put my premium, the more commission I, the agent, makes. You, the client, the more you pay in premium, the less cash value you'll have up front and long term. Now, here's the key thing to understand. When you're designing a policy based on these numbers, not anyone else's numbers, but your numbers. If you come to me and you say, Denzel, I have $70,000, my goal Denzel is to pay $70,000 for as long as humanly possible, right? So notice how my policy is only designed to put in 70 grand for, 70 year, for seven years, right? If I do that, what I'm saying is after year eight, I'll only be able to put in a maximum of 28 thousand dollars according to the MEC laws, the insurance company's limitations, and the PUA rules of Guardian Life Insurance Company, excuse me, of America.